This is Chapter 7 on Cash and Receivables. Chapter 7 presents a detailed discussion of two of the primary liquid assets of a business enterprise, cash and receivables. Now, cash is the most liquid asset held by a business enterprise and possesses unique problems in its management and control. Receivables are composed of both accounts and notes receivable. Chapter coverage of the accounts receivable places emphasis on trade receivables and in covering note receivables, the, or notes receivable, the uh, chapter includes both short-term and long-term notes. The learning objectives are here. We're going to talk about the role that cash and accounts receivable play in a business, we'll talk about what financial assets are, identify things that would be considered cash and cash equivalents, and how they're reported on the financial statements. We'll define receivables and identify different types of receivables, and uh, look at accounting issues related to recognition and management of accounts receivable, some of which you'll be familiar with already and some of which will be uh, dealt with in more detail than in previous courses. We'll talk about the uh, accounting issues related to impairment of value, which is you know, bad debts, expense, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll also talk about um, accounting issu issues for short-term notes and loans receivable, and for long-term notes and, lo and loans receivable. We'll talk about how to de-recognize receivables, how to write them off, essentially. We'll talk about uh, some of the analysis issues uh, sort of accounts receivable turnover and day sales and accounts receivable, that sort of uh, analysis measurement. We'll talk a little bit about ASPE and IFRS and what differences there are between the accounting standards in those two areas. And a little bit about what changes are expected in the future. Uh, Appendix 7A, we're not going to cover that in, uh, in this course, but uh, well, maybe we will. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, the, the main idea of controlling cash, we're, uh, we're talking about uh, bank reconciliations, and I think there may be a lab or two dealing with uh, bank reconciliations. So we may, may append uh, an additional video lecture for the uh, Appendix 7A PowerPoints. I'll see how it goes. All right, so the uh, handbook references are given here. Current assets and current liabilities are included in Section 1510. Uh, the ASPE standards in uh, International Accounting Standard Number 1, Cash and Cash Equivalents, Section 1540 and IAS 7, Financial Instruments for Recognition and Measurement, Section 3856 in ASPE, IFRS 9 and IAS 39 to a lesser extent. Financial Instruments presentation is, dis is discussed in Section 3856, and IAS 32, Disclosure, Section 3856 for ASPE, and IFRS 7. So the, uh, the layout of the PowerPoint we're going to talk about today, we'll talk about understanding cash and accounts receivable, management and control of cash in particular, the appendix deals with uh, bank reconciliations as a major way of controlling cash. Uh, it also talks about petty cash and how to uh, record uh, transactions that run through petty cash. We'll talk about the different types of accounts receivable, how do companies manage them. We'll talk about cash its recognition and measurement, what exactly is cash, uh, what qualifies as cash and what doesn't. We'll talk about recognition and measurement of receivables, presentation, disclosure, and analysis, the differences between IFRS, IFRS and ASPE, and probably we'll deal with Appendix 7A as well in the cash controls. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about bank accounts, the uh, petty cash system, and physical protection of cash balances. How do you actually make, make sure that you uh, don't expose your cash to uh, use which isn't appropriate for your business? And then we'll talk about reconciliation, bank reconciliations, which is kind of the, the major cash control uh, reconciliation. OK. So uh, cash and accounts receivable. Uh, cash is uh, necessary to pay bills. And so you have to have enough cash to do that. So we talk uh, in a couple of other courses, we talk about in Business 371, the management of cash and how we make sure that we have an adequate balance between too much cash and too little cash. If we have too much cash, that means that we're uh, giving up potential earnings on that cash. If we have too little cash, it uh, makes it difficult to make our payments on time and uh, compromises our supplier relationships and things like that. So we kind of have a, uh, a trade-off between carrying costs of having too much c cash uh, 
and the opportunity cost of having too little. For accounts receivable, some of the major issues uh, for accounts receivable are ensuring that we have adequate credit policies and finding ways to actually speed up the collection of cash because the sooner we get the cash back to our uh, our bank account, the the less costly it is because we don't have to pay interest on borrowing uh, as much and uh, it's a fairly substantial impact and it's essentially a perpetuity of additional value if we have more money collected more quickly. All right, so a financial asset, the definition is given here. It's either cash or a contractual right to receive cash or some other financial asset. Uh, it could be a contractual right to exchange financial instruments with another party under conditions that are potentially favorable to this entity uh, or an equity instrument of another entity. So an equity instrument would be shares of another company. So the cost incurred by an ent entity to purchase a right to reacquire its own equity instruments from another party is a deduction from its equity. It's not a financial asset, but equity instruments of other entities are financial assets. So what is cash? Cash is a financial asset and a financial instrument. It consists of coin, currency, bank deposits, negotiable instruments such as money orders, certified checks, cashier's checks, bank drafts. Cash that has been designated for a specific use other than payment of currently maturing obligations is segregated from the general cash account, and this amount may be classified as a current asset, asset if it will be dis dispersed within one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. Otherwise, the amount should be shown as a non-current asset. Post-dated checks, travel advances, and stamps are not classified as cash because they're not recoverable in the same way. So post-dated checks are not cash yet. They will be in the future. Travel advances are uh, committed to a particular purpose, and so they're not available for use as cash. And stamps, of course, you can't use them uh, as cash. Although, historically, there was a time that stamps were treated as, as a currency because that was all that was available. All right, the reporting of cash. Uh, the reporting of cash is relatively straightforward. But there are a number of issues that merit special attention. Restricted cash, cash in foreign currencies, bank overdrafts, and cash equivalents are some of those items. Restricted cash, uh, there's a number of ways that cash can be restricted. One is uh, through a compensating balance arrangement uh, to support existing borrowings. Basically, it's, it's, a way, it's a way that banks can uh, minimize the risk of lending money. So it's common practice for an enterprise to have an agreement with the bank concerning credit and borrowing arrangements. And when such an agreement exists, the bank may, be, may require the enterprise to maintain a minimum cash balance on deposit. That minimum balance is known as a compensating balance. When it's material, compensating balances uh, that result in legally restricted deposits must be separately classified in the balance sheet. The nature of the borrowing arrangement determines whether the compensating balance is classified as a current asset or a non-current asset. didn't the petty cash special payroll accounts or dividend accounts are examples of cash set aside for a special purpose although they're usually not material to the financial statements they would also be separately disclosed petty cash is usually petty it's not usually a, an amount that's of any a great value so not disclosing it separately doesn't really uh, cause any material difference foreign currencies uh, the uh, issues of foreign currencies uh, are often quite complex, and so we deal with them in some detail in the Advanced Financial Accounting course. But here, we should note that uh, we do disclose our financial statements in uh, Canadian dollars for the most part, uh, and so the foreign currencies would be translated to Canadian dollars at the date of, this, of the uh, presentation of the financial statements. Bank overdrafts occur when a check is written for more than the amount in the cash account. Bank overdrafts should be accounted for as a current liability, and if material, this should be separately disclosed as such. Uh, they shouldn't be just offset against the cash account. Uh, 
because they represent two different uh, items. There's the financial asset and the financial obligation. And by offsetting against each other, you're assuming uh, a contractual right which may not exist. Now, it's possible that bank overdrafts could be offset against available cash in another account in the same bank because usually uh, the banking arrangement is one whole contract and it doesn't, uh, there's no restriction or no contractual restriction uh, about paying bank overdrafts from other cash accounts in the same bank. Now, cash equivalence. The idea of cash equivalence is important for a couple of reasons. One is the uh, cash flow statement, uh, as we discussed last chapter. So cash equivalents are short-term, highly liquid investments that are both readily convertible to known amounts of cash and so near their maturity that they represent an insignificant risk of change in the interest rates. So, for example, a 30-day treasury bill would be a government bond uh, with a very short, short-term short time frame, maturity date. A short-term commercial paper, uh, that's basically an IU, IOU uh, written to a company that has lent money for, a, for overnight purposes. Money market funds are mutual funds made up of investments in government securities and short-term treasury bills. Now, ASPE, ASPE excludes equity investments from the definition of cash equivalents, but IFRS allows some equity investments, such as preferred shares close to the redemption date, uh, to be included as a cash equivalent. Now, most preferred shares, preferred shares don't have a redemption date, so preferred shares that have a redemption date are unusual in, in uh, any sense of the <laughs> description. Um, so preferred shares can be a part of cash and cash equivalents for IFRS. Cash equivalents must be measured at their fair value. Investments classified as cash equivalents are very short term. So therefore their cost or their cost plus any accrued interest is generally the same as their fair value. So introducing the idea of receivables. Receivables are financial assets and financial instruments. They're defined as claims held against customers and others for money, goods, or services. Accounts receivable are verbal or understood promises of the purchaser to pay for goods and services sold. So notes and notes receivable are written promises to pay a certain sum of money on a specified future date. Notes receivable, you can basically say they're IOUs uh, with specified terms. Open accounts receivable are short-term extensions of credit that are based on a purchaser's oral promise to pay for goods and services and, you, and are usually collected within 30 to 60 days. Receivables may be generally classified as current or non-current. Current receivables are expected to be collected with one year, within one year or during the current operating cycle, whichever is longer. All other receivables are classified as non-current. Receivables may also be classified as trade or non-trade. Trade receivables, accounts receivable and notes receivable, are usually the most significant receivables that an enterprise possesses. Notes receivable are also loans receivable because they tend to arise from financial or investing transactions. Non-trade receivables arise from a variety of transactions and can be written promises either to pay or to deliver. Non-trade receivables are generally classified and reported as separate items on the balance sheet when they're material in amount. Issues in accounts receivable. General standards exist for recognizing and measuring accounts receivable, which includes when to recognize when the entity becomes a party to the contractual provisions of the financial instrument, and value to use, uh, the value to use initially or fair value, and the subsequent value, the amortized cost of uh, the accounts receivable. In most receivable transactions, the amount to be recognized is the exchange price. That's the amount due from the debtor between two parties to a sales transaction. Two elements that must be considered in measuring receivables are first, the availability of discounts, or the trade discounts or cash discounts, or and uh, uh, the other item is the length of time between the sale and the payment due date or the interest factor. If it's significant, we would actually use time value principles to determine the present value of the uh, future obligation. So there's an outline here in the PowerPoint uh, outlining what kinds of non-trade receivables might be included in accounts receivable. Now, two types of discounts that must be considered in determining the value of receivables are trade discounts and cash discounts. Trade discounts represent reductions from the list or catalog prices of merchandise, and they're often used to avoid frequent changes in catalogs or to quote different prices for different quantities purchased. Cash discounts, also called sales discounts, are offered as an inducement for prompt payment. 
and are communicated in terms of the read, for example, 2% 10, net 30. That's the way you read the 2 slash 10 N30 uh, disclosure uh, notation as shown on this, power, this PowerPoint slide. 2% 10, <coughs> excuse me, 2% 10 net 30 uh, means that 2%, there's a 2% discount if it's paid within 10 days of the purchase or invoice date. Otherwise, the entire gross amount is due in 30 days. Receivables should be measured at their net realizable value, and using the net method would reflect this. But in general, the gross method is used. However, if an allowance for sales discounts is used with the, with the gross method, the net effect would result in recognizing accounts receivable at their realizable value. Now, the gross method records sales and accounts receivable at the gross amount of the sale. Sales discounts are recognized if the customer pays within the discount period. Sales discounts are reported on the income statement as a deduction from sales in the determination of net sales. The net method records sales and accounts receivable at an amount net of any cash discount. If the customer does not pay within the discount period, sales discounts forfeited is debited for the lost discount. Sales discounts forfeited is reported on the income statement under the other expense and income section. So here's an example of the gross method. If we made $10,000 of sales on credit under the gross method, we would record a debit to accounts receivable for the full 10,000 and credit sales re revenue for the same amount. And if the customer pays of the account within the discount period, we would record the cash received, which would be 9,800 less the $200 discount. The discount would be recorded at $200 and the accounts receivable would be no longer owing. So they would be removed in their entirety. The net method with the same transaction we would record the debit to accounts receivable for 9800 the amount less the discount, and the sales revenue would be recorded as 9800 as well. And the customer, if the customer paid the account after the discount period, then we would get $10,000 of cash, the accounts receivable would go away, and the sales discounts forfeited to balance would be a $200 credit. Impairment of accounts receivable. To properly match expenses to sales revenue, it's sometimes necessary to establish additional allowance accounts as contra accounts to accounts receivable if sales returns are expected to be significant. The most common allowance is the allowance for sales returns and allowances. And uh, ideally, receivable, receivables should be measured in terms of their present value. When expected cash receipts require a waiting period, the amount actually received is not worth the receivable face amount. In practice, accountants have generally chosen to ignore this for accounts receivable because the amount of the discount is not usually material in relation to the net income for the period. In subsequent periods, accounts receivable should be measured at amortized cost. However, where there is no interest element that has been recognized, cost and amortized cost would be the same. The uh, Net realizable value for accounts receivable refers to the fact that uh, we need to adjust it for the amount that we're actually expecting to collect. And so we take the gross accounts receivable less any estimated uncollectible amounts and returns, allowances, and cash discounts, as we've just described. Uh, loans and receivables are impaired if there's a significant adverse change in their expected configuration of cash flows. So essentially, they're not meeting their, the terms of payment as described in their agreement. So uh, we see that in the financial statements that uh, accounts receivable are described as net of the allowance for doubtful accounts on the balance sheet. The uh, estimation of uncollectible, uh, uncollectible receivables. Uh, there's a couple of methods to do this. Uh, it's highly unlikely that a company that extends credit to its customers will be successful in collecting all of its receivables. Uh, thus, some method must be adopted to account for receivables that ultimately prove to be uncollectible. The most important indicator used to identify an impaired account receivable is how long the, the account has been outstanding. A company commonly estimates the amounts that will be uncollectible by using an aging method. Past experience is used to estimate the percentage of its uh, outstanding receivables that will become uncollectible without identifying specific accounts. This is referred to as the percentage of receivables approach. With the objective of reporting receivables on the balance sheet as the present value of the cash that is expected to be received. The percentage used may be a combined rate or an individual percentage applied to each group within an aging category. 
An allowance method is used to account for the estimate of impairment, and this method results in receivables being stated at the estimated realizable value on the balance sheet. Now, use of the allowance method requires a year-end estimate of expected uncollectible amounts based on outstanding receivables. This method is ke in keeping with the current account. This method is in keeping with the current accounting model that emphasizes insurance insuring actual. Easy for me to say. Let's try this sentence again. This method is in keeping with the current accounting model that emphasizes ensuring accurate measurement of assets and liabilities. The model assumes that if assets and liabilities are properly measured, so will be the related revenues and expenses. The estimate is recorded by debiting an expense and crediting an allowance account. Then in a subsequent period when an account is deemed to be uncollectible, an entry is made debiting the allowance account and crediting the accounts receivable to remove the accounts receivable from the books. There are two accounting procedures that can be used when employing the allowance method, both of which will result in the same ending balances in the allowance and bad debt expense accounts. They are the allowance procedure only, which means that month-end management estimates estimates uncollectible accounts by analyzing the accounts receivable balances, and then an entry is made to adjust the allowance account to reflect the estimated uncollectible accounts. A mix of procedures at month-end the management would estimate the bad debt expense by using a percentage of sales method that estimates bad debts as a percentage of sales. If there's a fairly stable relationship between previous year's credit sales and bad debts, then that relationship can be used as a percentage to estimate bad debts based on the current period sales. This can be done much more quickly on an interim basis than the aging process required by the percentage of receivables method. And at the end of the fiscal year, when financial statements are issued, however, the percentage of receivables appro pro approach or procedure is applied and any adjustment required is made to ensure that accounts receivable are accurately reported at net realizable value. Either of the two methods can be used. Many companies use the mix of procedures method, so they would use the percentage of sales method throughout the year and then at the end of the year uh, adjust it or mix it uh, to some degree with the uh, percentage of receivables method to set up the allowance. Uh, in the 253, we call these the balance sheet approach and the income statement approach. The income statement approach used the income, the sales, to determine the, the uh, expense, the bad debt expense, to match against it, uh, whereas the uh, balance sheet approach estimated the balance sheet uh, valuation adjustment for the allowance of deductible accounts. And uh, so one uses balance sheet information to produce a balance sheet item, and then the bad debt expense would be a plug on the other side of the transaction. The other method, the income statement method, calculates bad debt expense and plugs the other side to the balance sheet allowance for deductible accounts. An estimate of bad debts is used for internal reporting using the percentage of completion throughout the year and uh, the percentage of completion. Uh, that, sorry. Uh, either of the above two methods, either the uh, allowance procedure only or the uh, mix of procedures. Uh, may be used. Many companies actually use the mix of procedures method and use, they make an estimate of bad debts for internal reporting using the percentage of sales method throughout the year. An adjustment is made at the year end based on the aged accounts receivable, uh, re receivable balances. So, uh, income statement method throughout the year, balance sheet at the end of the year. So, the income statement approach can be said to, to focus on matching the bad debt expense to the sales, whereas uh, the allowance procedure by itself just focuses on setting up a net realizable value for the asset value, and so the bad debt expense tends to be uh, a residual of that calculation. If you're uh, basing your uh, allowance for deductible accounts on the income statement-based approach, you're focusing on matching, and if you're uh, if you're setting up a balance sheet approach, you're focusing on uh, net realizable value or fair value for the asset. Here's an example of an aging schedule. Wilson has 547,000 of total accounts receivable, most of which is fairly current, under 60 days, uh, 460,000 of the balance, and then there's some that are older, 61 to 90 days, 
is uh, $18,000. There's a fairly significant item over 120 days. They would determine the uh, allowance procedure based on different percentages applied to each of these different ages. So for example, the uh, under 60 days, 4% of those are expected to go bad. The ones over uh, 61 to 90 days would be 15%. The ones uh, over 90 days but less than 120 would be 20%, and 25% of the ones over 120 days would be expected to not ever be recovered. So if you add all of those up, multiply them by the balances at that age, and uh, add them up, you end up with 37650 and that's the target balance in the allowance for deductible accounts. You would adjust whatever the current balance is in the allowance to that number, and that would be the amount of your entry. So in this case, we need to adjust the existing $800 credit balance up to $37,650. We need to increase it by $36,850. And so that's the increase in the allowance for, for deductible accounts. And the credit goes to the allowance. The debit goes to bad debts expense. And bad debts expense is just derivative of our allowance for deductible accounts calculation. Now, the mix of procedures. The advocates of the allowance method contend that its use provides for a proper matching of revenues and expenses as well as reflecting a proper carrying value for accounts receivable at the end of the period. And when the allowance method is used, the estimated amount of uncollectible accounts is normally based on a percentage of sales or accounts res or outstanding receivables. The percentage of sales method attempts to match costs with revenues and is frequently referred to as the income statement approach. The percentage of receivables approach provides a reasonably accurate estimate of the net realizable value of receivables shown on the statement of financial position. And this approach is commonly referred to as the balance sheet approach or statement of financial position approach. The method used to determine the amount of bad debt expense each year affects the amount of expenses uh, that are recorded. And so under the percentage of sales method, the amount recorded as bad debt expense is the amount determined by multiplying the estimated percentage times the credit sales. However, under the percentage of receivables approach, the unadjusted ending balance in the allowance account must be considered in arriving at bad debt expense for the year. The International Accounting Standards Board uh, provides detailed guidelines to be used in determining whether a receivable should be considered uncollectible or impaired. Assessing for impairment is done annually. Possible loss events include signif significant financial uh, problems of a customer or actual payment defaults. Uh, renegotiation, renegotiation of receivable terms due to customers' financial difficulties. Uh, perhaps a measurable decrease in future cash flows from a group of receivables since the initial recognition. And even though the decrease cannot be identified with individual assets in the group, uh, there is indication that their future cash flows may not meet the required uh, agreement. Now, a receivable is considered impaired when a loss event indicates a negative impact on the estimated future cash flows to be received from the receivable. And so ISB requires that the impairment assessment should be performed as follows. First, receivables that are individually significant should be considered for impairment separately. If impaired, it should be recognized as such. Receivables that are not individually significant may but do not have to be assessed individually. Any receivable individually assessed that is not considered impaired should be included with a group of assets with similar risk characteristics and collectively assessed for impairment. And any receivables not individually assessed should be collectively assessed for impairment uh, together as a group. The mix of procedures example shown here uh, the corporation reports the following balances. Their net credit sales are 400000 and historically they've seen that 2% of net credit sales generally are not recovered. So you would estimate this year's bad debt expense as 2% of 400000 or $8,000, which is calculated as shown here. So you record the bad debt expense, and the balance in allowance for deductible accounts would increase by 8000 without regard to the current balance. You would need to worry about what the balance actually is in the allowance for doubtful accounts. If over time the allowance for doubtful accounts became a strange uh, result, if you ended up with a very large credit balance, uh, you may have overestimated the uh, percentage of sales. That would be uncollectible. And as such, you might adjust your experience and change the percentage in the future. Balance sheet presentation of, an, of uh, accounts receivable. It usually describes the amount of the accounts receivable uh, as, uh, in, as sort of its face value. Uh, 
minus the allowance for deductible accounts and the net realizable value is the value that actually gets added into the current assets in the balance sheet. Now, actually writing off accounts receivable. We, uh, we set up the allowance method for, spe for specifically the purpose of, a, of keeping the accounts receivable open and still attempting to collect it, even though we think there's a high likelihood that it might not be collected. We still want our accounts receivable clerks to try. So we don't actually take it off the books until we're actually convinced that it should be determined to be uncollectible in, in finality. So only when that happens, we actually use the allowance for deductible accounts to reduce the amounts of accounts receivable. So the accounts receivable for the specific customer we're running off gets credited and taken off the books, and we no longer worry about trying to collect it. And the allowance for doubtful accounts is reduced to offset it. So we're recognizing that that allowance for doubtful accounts has been used to write off the accounts receivable. So both the allowance for doubtful accounts and the accounts receivable goes down, but the net, re net realizable value of total accounts receivable would still be the same. If we actually received payment after having written off the account, we would set up the accounts receivable again, sort of undo the write-off entry, and then record the collection as a separate journal entry. For some cash-based businesses with few credit transactions, a simpler method of recording a bad debt expense is the use of the direct write-off method. So you wouldn't actually bother setting up an allowance uh, just when you recognize that you weren't going to collect a debt that you had been promised. Under the direct write-off method, the receivable account is reduced and an expense is recorded when an, a specific account is determined to be uncollectible. The direct write-off method is theoretically deficient because it usually does not result in receivables being stated at their estimated realizable value on the balance sheet, but the direct write-off method is regarded uh, the, uh, the direct write-off method is regarded as inappropriate if the amount deemed uncollectible is material. A subsequent recovery is recorded in a revenue account called uncollectible accounts recovered. Short-term notes receivable. The major differences between trade accounts receivable and trade note re notes receivable are that notes represent a formal promise to pay and notes bear an interest element because of the time value of money. Notes always bear an interest element because of the time value of money, but they may be classified as interest-bearing or non-interest-bearing. Interest-bearing notes have a stated rate of interest, whereas non-interest-bearing notes, or zero interest-bearing notes, include the interest as part of their face amount instead of stating it explicitly. So here's an example. Uh, if financial statements are prepared while the notes outstanding, interest would be accrued at the balance sheet date for both the interest and non-interest bearing notes. And here's an example of one that's uh, actually s with a stated interest rate. So the interest rate is stated as 6%. So the accounts receivable of $1,000 is given up and we get a note receivable back for $1,000 and they're promising to pay us a 6% rate of return when they uh, pay us the note. And so we issued the the uh, note on March the 1st, or March the 14th, rather. And then uh, six months later, we received payment. The payment would have recorded the, uh, the note receivable of $1,000 plus the interest on the note receivable. So 1000 that 6% would be 60 bucks, but it's only been outstanding for half a year. So the interest income is $30. The total amount of cash we received is 1030 And the $30 would be recorded as interest income to separate it from the amount of accounts receivable uh, derived from sales. Uh, a non-interest bearing note, here's an example of $5,000 nine month non-interest bearing notes is, is issued and 8% is the implied interest rate. Our notes receivable would be recorded as 47.17 and we would give up cash of 47.17. And so in response, we would get paid $5,000 in nine months and the note receivable would be written off, and the interest income would be recorded as the difference between the cash received and the note receivable. In this case, 47,700 times 8% times nine months out of 12 would be $283. Long-term notes receivable or long-term loans receivable. Uh, with long-term loans receivable, it's assumed that a note exists, but the difference is the length of time to maturity. Standards for recognition and measurement are the same for loans as they are for notes. Transaction costs in acquiring loans or notes receivable 
can be expensed when incurred or added to the fair value of the instrument and added to the discount or premium to be amortized over the life of the loan, requiring the effective rate of interest to be recalculated under IFRS and ASPI when the effective interest method of amortization is used. Uh, both ASPI and IFRS agree that the effective interest method should be used with transaction costs associated with financial assets carried at amortization cost or amortized cost. So both ASPI and IFRS agree that the effective interest method is uh, the most appropriate method and it should be used and the transaction costs associated with the financial assets would be carried at amortized cost. So you would amortize them over the life of the, uh, of the loan agreement. Recognition and measurement standards include uh, requirements for a loan receivable to be recognized when the, pen the entity becomes a party to the contractual provisions of the financial instrument. And when initially recognized, the loan would be received, the loan receivable would be measured at its fair value, rather. After the initial recognition, the loan receivable would be measured at amortized costs. So we would amortize the cost of any transaction costs uh, over the life of the asset into interest income or interest expense, depending on whether it was a premium or discount. Bad debt losses on the loans receivable would be recognized when they're deemed to be impaired. And so we would have to record that to reduce the fair value if the uh, value of the loan was, was reduced. Now, long-term notes receivable should be recorded and reported at the present value of the cash expected to be collected. So when the interest stated on an interest-bearing note is equal to the effective mar market rate of interest, the note would sell at face value. And when the stated amount is, the stated rate is different from the market rate, the cash exchanged, or the present value, is different from the face value of the note. The difference between the face value and the cash exchanged, either uh, discount or premium, is then recorded and amortized over the life of the note to a approximate the effective interest rate. The discount or premium is shown on the balance sheet as a direct deduction from or addition to the face of the note. Now under IFRS, the effective interest method of amortization is used for the discount or premium, while under ASPE the amortization method is not specified and some private ent entities prefer to use the straight line method to amortize discounts and premiums because it's simpler. So you'll have to actually use your financial calculator to calculate the present value of the loan and then calculate the amount of interest uh, that uh, was actually earned while waiting to receive payment on the long-term notes receivable. So here's an example. Morgan Corp issued a $10,000, 10% three-year note. The market interest rate is 12% and the annual interest payments are $1,000. So they get 10% times $10,000 every year. So in calculating the note's present value, we would uh, use 12% as the market rate to discount all the future cash flows. And so if you're putting that into your financial calculator, $10,000 would be the uh, future value and the payment would be $1,000. And the I per Y interest rate would be 12%. And the N would be three years. So remember uh, with your financial calculator, that if you're calculating the present value of a series of payments, the present value uh, must be calculated so that the N, the I per Y, and the payment are the same in periods. And so all of these are annual in this case. So it's three years, three is N. The interest rate is 12% per annum, per annum. So it goes in as 12. And the annual interest payments are $1,000. So all of that gets put into your calculator. If you computed the present value, you should get 95.20. And 95.20 is the uh, the value of the note. So we debit notes receivable and credit cash for 95.20. So essentially, that's what we're that's what we're lending them 95.20, and then they'll pay us back 10,000, which represents the uh, the face value payment. Now, in this case, because the market interest rate is 12%, and we're only paying 10%. That means we're paying actually less than the demanded rate of return for similar loans. And as such, they won't pay us the full face value. They'll pay us something less than that. If both of the interest rates, the, both the interest rate, the market interest rate, and the, uh, uh, the payment uh, were at both at 10%, then the note receivable would be exactly at face value. So it would be $10,000. If uh, we were paying 12% and the market interest rate was 10%, we'd have a premium bond 
and the bond would actually trade for more than its uh, face value of ten thousand dollars just like bonds in 370 in business 370 so on the date of the issue the company would have an unamortized discount of 480 dollars to be amortized over the three years so that's calculated as the 9520 minus the ten thousand dollars so there's 480 to bring in to income somehow now the uh, effective interest rate is what's described here uh, 9520 is the opening principal balance 12 percent is the interest rate for the first year so it's 1142 we would uh, get paid our cash for the thousand dollars we would reduce the notes receivable and record interest income of 1142 uh, did i say reduce the notes receivable it's a debit so therefore that would be an increase to notes receivable so we calculate the interest income of 1142 we get the amount of cash promised, which is $1,000. And so the notes receivable would only would actually go up to 142, which is an amortization uh, or an accretion of the discount. That's the effective interest mate method that we're, that we're calculating here. So continuing the example, the book value of the notes receivable is now 96.62, and that becomes the principal balance for the next year's interest calculation. So once again, interest income is that amount 11.59 and the amount of cash received is still a thousand so in this case the discount on notes receivable uh, it should be the same <laughs> account it should just be notes receivable the discount on notes receivable uh, the the notation there it should be the same as the previous entry so it could be either discount on notes receivable for both of them which would actually reduce the discount on the notes receivable uh, or uh, it would just be debited to the notes receivable balance in its entirety. So, when a note or loan is issued with the sale of property, goods, or services, the selling price will be equal to the present value of the cash flows promised by the note, discounted at the market rate of interest. And whenever the face amount of a note does not reasonably represent the present value of the consideration given or received in the exchange, the accountant must evaluate the entire arrangement to record properly the exchange and the subsequent interest. Notes receivable are sometimes issued with zero interest rate, stated or at a stated rate that is unreasonable in such cases the present value of the note is measured by the cash proceeds to the borrower or the fair value of the property goods or services rendered the difference between the face amount of the note and the cash proceeds or fair value of the property represents the total amount of interest during the life of the note so if the fair value of the property goods or services uh, is not determinable the estimation of the present value requires use of an imputed uh, interest rate and the choice of a rate may be affected specifically by the credit standing of the issuer, restrictive covenants, collateral payment, the existing prime interest rate, a number of different things. Essentially, you're looking to determine uh, the imputed interest rate on the basis of what a normal financing transaction would cost for, for the business. So if they've got quotes from their bank uh, for other loans, that would be a reasonable estimate of the imputed interest rate so determination of the imputed interest rate is made when the note is received and any subsequent changes in prevailing interest rates are ignored and so we just consider the time at the uh, issue of the of the loan and the interest context then now um, under ASPI you're allowed to use the straight line method and so instead of using the effective interest method where we actually calculated the opening principle times the, uh, the rate of interest, the market rate of interest, you would just take the 480 and divide that evenly by the three years. IFRS requires the use of the effective interest method, but ASPE doesn't specify it, so you could actually use a straight line method. The straight line method was the uh, method for amortizing bond and, and bond discounts and premiums back when I went to school many, many years ago. But now it's uh, no longer acceptable because we all have our financial calculators to calculate the effective interest. The valuation of short-term notes receivable and the related recognition of bad debt and expense and allowance parallels that for accounts receivable. So companies often use uh, one of the collective assessment methods, either the percentage of receivables or the percentage of sales methods to determine possible impairments of short-term notes receivable as well. The valuation of long-term receivables involves impairment testing on an individual note basis. The test involves comparing the carrying amount of the note to the present value of the future value, the future cash flows 
discounted at the original effective interest rate. If the discounted amount is less than the carrying value of the note, then an impairment has occurred, and the journal entry would include a debit to bad debt expense and a credit to an allowance for doubtful accounts. A loan receivable is considered impaired when it is probable, based on current information and events, that the company will be unable to collect all the amounts due for principal and interest. If a loan is considered impaired, the loss due to the impairment is calculated as the difference between the investment in the loan, essentially the principal plus any accrued interest, and the expected future cash flow is discounted at the loan's historical effective cash rate, effective interest rate. So essentially we'd calculate the present value of the future cash flows uh, and compare that to the carrying value. And if they were uh, different, you would write off the difference. De-recognition of receivables. Uh, De-recognition of a receivable. Uh, we're not talking about setting up an allowance or writing them off here. We're talking about uh, either uh, well, using uh, the receivables as a way of getting cash uh, early. And there's a couple of ways that that can happen. They can be used as collateral for borrowing, or it can actually be a sale. So you're actually selling the receivables as an asset to someone else. Now, how would you actually determine that? Well, that's a very good question. Derecognition of a receivable occurs when it can no longer be included as an asset of the company. For example, when a receivable no longer has any value because the customer is bankrupt, so the write-off would be an example of a derecognition, or when the company sells its receivables to another company, transferring the risks and rewards of ownership to that other company. Now, receivables are often used as collateral in borrowing transactions to generate in immediate cash in one of a couple of ways. Uh, secured borrowing or, a sales or sales of receivables. In secured borrowing, the creditor often requires that the debtor, the debtor uh, designate or pledge the receivables as security for a loan. If the loan isn't paid when due, the creditor has the right to convert the collateral to cash, so that is to collect the receivables. A company should be account for transferred assets in a secured borrowing after the transaction in the same way it accounted for them prior to the borrowing and account for the liability in accordance with accounting policies for similar liabilities. So the accounts receivable would stay on the books in the same way as they had been recorded before the transaction, but now they have a new liability with the accompanying receipt of cash. In order to accelerate the receipt of cash, companies may transfer accounts or notes receivable to another company for cash. Companies wishing to avoid the 30 to 60 day collective collection period for accounts receivable may generate cash immediately by selling or factoring their accounts receivable. Factoring of accounts receivable is an outright sale of the receivables to a finance company or bank. Now, when accounts and notes receivable are factored or sold, the factoring arrangement can be either with recourse or without recourse. If receivables are factored on a with recourse basis, the seller guarantees payment to the factor in the event the debtor does not make payment. So when a factor buys receivables without recourse, the factor assumes the risk of collectability and absorbs any credit losses. Receivables that are factored with recourse should be accounted for as a sale, recognizing any gain or loss. If all three of the following conditions are met, the transferred asset has been isolated from the transferor, so it's no longer their asset. The transferees have obtained the right to pledge or exchange either the transferred assets or beneficial in the transferred assets, ben beneficial interest in the transferred assets, so they can tell someone else they own these accounts receivable, essentially. The transferor does not maintain effective control over the transferred assets through an agreement to repurchase or redeem them before their maturity. And that's just the, the recourse part. Uh, so uh, receivables that are factored with recourse should be accounted for as a sale if all three of the following conditions are met. Uh, the transferred asset has been isolated. So the, uh, uh, the, transfers, the transferred asset the accounts receivable that had been transferred has been isolated from the transferor, so it's transferor, so it's no longer uh, collected by them. It's collected by the new company. Uh, the transferees have obtained the right to pledge or exchange either the transferred assets or beneficial interest, so they can actually use it to they can sell it to someone else. And the transferor does not maintain effective control over the transferred assets through an agreement to repurchase or redeem them before their maturity. So all three of these things uh, have to be in place uh, for it to be recognized as a sale. Increasingly common is the transfer of receivables through a process called securitization. 
Securitization is the transformation of financial assets, such as loans and receivables, into securities called asset-backed securities. In such an arrangement, a special purpose entity is transferred the ownership of the loans or receivables and is financed by the issuance of debt and equity securities. Uh, many companies have tended to account for transactions as sales of receivables even when they had substantial controlling interest and control over the receivables. Accounting standards governing the recognition of financial assets are not finalized. However, there are some key concepts that need to be considered when a transfer of receivables qualifies for treatment at a sale and when it's not simply and when it is simply a, a secured borrowing. So, uh, IFRS 9 has essentially this, uh, this analysis that you need to go through. Uh, IFRS 9, financial, excuse me, <coughs> IFRS 9, which is called financial instruments, states that the following conditions are used to indicate whether control over the receivables has actually been transferred by an entity supporting treatment as a sale. The entity transfers the uh, contractual right to receive cash flows from the accounts receivable. So the cash flows go to the uh, purchaser, not uh, or to the uh, transferee, not the transferor. Uh, so that's one possibility. Uh, So that's the question at the top of the slide here. Uh, if the entity transfers the contractual rights to receive cash flows from the accounts receivable, uh, then that supports treatment as a sale. If the entity retains the contractual rights to receive cash flows from the accounts receivable but has a contractual obligation to pay the cash flows to one or more recipients, then three additional conditions also must be met. The entity has no obligation to pay amounts uh, to the eventual recipient unless it collects equivalent amounts from the original receivable. Second, the, entry is per the entity is prohibited by the terms of the transfer contract from selling or pledging the original asset other than as security to the eventual recipients for the obligation to pay their cash flows. And third, the entity has an obligation to remit any cash flows it collects on behalf of the, event the eventual recipients without any material delay. So, uh, if the answer to the question, had they transferred the contractual rights to receive cash flows, is yes, then it should be treated as a sale. If no, then you would ask the additional questions. Uh, have all of these three conditions been met? The entity has an obligation to pay cash flows to one or more parties, the eventual recipients. So uh, if they receive the cash flows, they must pass them along. And the entity has no obligation to pay the events unless they collect equivalent uh, collections from the original receivable. So if their their customer pays them, then they'll pay the uh, the purchaser of the accounts receivable. If not, they don't have to. Uh, so essentially, the purchaser is still taking the risk of uh, not receiving those cash flows. So those two things, and the entity is prohibited from selling or pledging their original asset. So it's no longer their asset. They can't sell it or pledge it, uh, other than as security to the eventual recipients. So the purchaser uh, gets the right to sell or pledge the asset. And finally, the entity has an obligation to remit any cash flows collected on behalf of the eventual recip recipients without any significant delay. If any of those things are not true, then it's just a secured borrowing. If all of those things are true, then we classify it as a sale. Under IFRS 9, for accounts receivable without a significant financing component, the loss allowance is to be based on lifetime expected credit losses, which is defined as expected credit losses resulting from all possible default events over the life of the accounts receivable. Under ASPE, the main question is, is there a transfer of control? And those three questions that we discussed already. Are there are the transferred assets isolated from the transferor? And does the transferee have right to pledge or sell the assets? And does the transferor not maintain control of the assets through a repurchase agreement? So if all of those things are answered yes, then it's a sale. If any of them are answered no, it's a secured borrowing. So what does that mean? The transferred assets have been isolated from the transferor. That means they've been put beyond the reach of the transfer and its creditors, even in bankruptcy or receivership. So 
the if they go bankrupt, these are not assets of the company to be re to be liquidated and remitted to creditors of the company. The second one, each transferee has the right to pledge or uh, exchange the assets or beneficial interest it's received, and no condition either constrains the transferee from taking advantage of this right or provides more than a trivial benefit to the transferor. So basically, they can sell it as if it's their own asset. And finally, the transfer does not maintain transfer or does not maintain effective control over the transferred assets through either an a re agreement to repurchase or redeem them before their maturity, or through an ability to unilaterally cause the holder to return specific assets. So, if the transfer or doesn't have any source of control, they can't take them back if they want them back. Then that would be an indication that do, they do not maintain control through some kind of agreement. If all three conditions are not met, the seller must record the transaction as a secured borrowing. So this is a quick summary of uh, the treatment under ASPE for a transfer of receivables. Let's see the three conditions are listed here. Uh, then if the answer is yes, is there continuing involvement in collections, then uh, if the answer is yes, they are continued to to uh, be involved in things like collection of the accounts receivable and such. Then you record it as a sale and use the financial components approach, reduce the receivables, recognize the component assets uh, obtained and the liabilities incurred, and record a gain or loss. If there is no continuing involvement, then we record it as a sale, just reduce the receivables, and record the gain or loss at that time. Okay, so moving along. Secured borrowing, the highlights are listed here. Accounts, uh, if they're just secured borrowing, then you would keep the uh, accounts receivable the same way as uh, you had before. Now there would be collateralized, but that just means that they're committed to be used as security for the borrowing. So as you collect the accounts receivable, you would record any sales returns and sales discounts in the same way as you would before. You would absorb any bad debts expense, just as you would have done before. But now you have a new liability, a note payable. And so there uh, there could be a finance charge, uh, which would be a cost of getting financing. There would be an interest expense on the note payable. And you would make payments periodically from the collections, which would reduce the amount of uh, interest expense, presumably. Factoring. Uh, the ownership of the receivables transferred to the purchaser. The purchaser is called the factor. The receivables are recorded as an asset in the purchaser's books, not in your books any longer. If they're sold without recourse, the purchaser is fully responsible for collection, and uh, they're fully responsible for the risk of not collecting. The seller records any retained proceeds as due from the factor, which would be a receivable, which covers possible sales discounts and sales returns on allowances. And then the seller records the gain or loss on sale of the receivables. Uh, normally, it would be a loss because you would pay less than, or you would be paid less than the uh, the net realizable value of the of the receivables because you're not going to do the work of collecting them. Someone else is, uh, and the seller records any recourse liability. So if receivables are sold with recourse as a, a guarantee, then that recourse liability would have to be estimated and determined based on past experience. Presentation issues. Uh, presentation issues. The objective in presentation and disclosures related to receivables is to allow users to evaluate the significance of these financial assets to the entity's financial position and performance and to assess the nature and extent of the associated risks, uh, the risks associated with them. The presentation of accounts receivable of all receivables on the balance sheet includes the following considerations. You should segregate the carrying amounts of different categories. Uh, so trade receivables versus non-trade, uh, current versus long-term, and so on. Uh, we, you need to indicate the receivables classified as current and non-current in the statement of financial position. You would appropriately offset the valuation accounts for receivables that are impaired, including a discussion of individual and collectively determined impairments. Uh, it's disclosed the fair value of receivables in such a way that permits it to be compared with its carrying amount, and disclose information to assess the credit risk inherent in the receivables by providing information on receivables that are neither past due nor impaired, the carrying amount of receivables that would otherwise be past due or impaired, whose terms have been renegotiated, so renegotiated as notes, for example, 
uh, receivables that are either past due or impaired, an analysis of the age of receivables that are past due. That information should be disclosed as well. Disclose any receivables which are pledged as collateral and disclose any significant concentrations of credit risk arising from receivables. So if there's one large uh, corporate group that all uh, have significant amounts of, of uh, accounts receivable, you might note that as being a particular source of risk. Major disclosures are also required about the securitization or transfer of receivables, whether they're derecognized or not, and credit risk is a major concern associated with accounts and loans receivable, so IFRS requires more extensive information than what is required under ASPE. In evaluating the liquidity of receivables, the receivable turnover ratio is used where you calculate the ratio of the sales to the average accounts receivable. If you have two years of accounts receivable, you can calculate the average. Otherwise, you would use the uh, ending accounts receivable. And that would tell you how many times the uh, accounts receivable balance was uh, collected and then reestablished through sales during the year. If you want to know the day's sales in receivables, you take 365 and divide it by the receivable turnover ratio. So here's the calculation. The ratio used to assess the liquidity of receivables is the receivables turnover ratio, which measures the number of times on average receivables are collected during the period. Day sales collected is 365 over that number, and it tells you how long it takes you to collect the average accounts receivable balance. Finally, uh, comparing IFRS to ASPE, uh, you can look at illustration 7-19 in the text. The standards are similar. Issues related to impairment and derecognition are still under study in IFRS, and so they may be coming up out with additional requirements during your, uh, your career as a student of accounting. Uh, IFRS generally requires more extensive disclosures, as we've just described. The two set of standards are generally quite similar. IFRS allows preferred shares that are close to maturity date to be qualified as a cash equivalent. ASPE does not require use of the effective interest rate, uh, whereas IFRS generally does. So ASPE allows the straight line amortization of discounts or premiums into interest income or interest expense over the life of the related receivable balance. And when, in, when determining whether an asset should be derecognized, ASPE considers who has control of the asset, whereas IFRS considers whether the risks and rewards of ownership have been transferred using the flowcharts that we've uh, just looked at, uh, read just above. And that's it for Chapter 7.